But I submit to you today that we cannot stop there. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. And thank you to all the organizers and everyone who played a role in making this conference possible. It is an honor to be here and to share more with you all about my work at Data for Black Lives. Now more than ever, we need spaces like these to make demands for fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. But I submit to you today that we cannot stop there, that we will never achieve fairness, accountability, and transparency without first and foremost demanding justice, power, and self-determination. This is an academic conference and certainly an important one, but the stakes are not academic. They are real lives on the line. When I started Data for Black Lives, I made the conscious decision to not just build a 501c3 organization, but a movement. I did this because I knew that we couldn't rely on big tech companies or other institutions to do the right thing in the event of harm or to course correct when called out. And I knew as history had shown us time and time again, we needed to be coordinated and organized across communities and across differences to be able to respond when the government and those we put in office could not. I started Data for Black Lives because I knew that until we found new ways to build and exercise the political power of Black people, our, our survival would continue to be under assault. Data became the vehicle for shifting power away from unaccountable actors and irresponsible decision makers to the people who for too long had bore the brunt and carried the burden of a country where money is power and power is hoarded and guarded aggressively and ferociously by public policy. Today, I will be addressing the themes of this conference, the COVID-19 pandemic, structural racism, and the role that the work in machine learning and data plays. I will discuss this by telling the story of how I learned how to build the power, the political power of Black people, and how we are doing this every day at Data for Black Lives. What does it mean to build political power? What is political power? Political power is one's ability or the collective ability to influence the decisions that impact their lives. Political power goes beyond voting in the ballot box because as we have seen, one can have the right to vote, but no political power. Political power cannot be confused with virality or media presence because as we've witnessed time and time again, every news station, every social media news feed could spread the word about a murder at the hands of those whose job it is to protect and to serve and still no accountability, no justice, no change. At Data for Black Lives, we are using data of all things to build the political power of Black people. I learned to do this out of necessity in the harshest conditions. After college, I returned to Miami where I grew up and led a campaign that resulted in a landmark policy change in the largest public hospital in the country, our local public hospital. My job returning from college and after having started at this organization as a youth organizer, coming back to a very different organization economically in very different conditions in Miami, my job was simple as I was told. I had about six months 
to complete a survey that collected data on the experiences of mothers giving birth in the hospitals in Miami. I had just came back from college where thankfully due to an open curriculum, my own tenacity and hunger to gain these skills, I was able to skip the line and take graduate level courses that made me an expert in research methodologies, data collection and data analysis. When I got to Miami, I knew the data that we were collecting was necessary, but it would not be as powerful if we did not do more than disseminate findings in a report. We needed to take this information and literally put it into the hands of the women's whose real life experiences were reflected in the surveys we collected. We needed to pass the policy that had been the original goal of the campaign years ago when I had just been a youth organizer. And when institutional support, foundational support made it possible for us to achieve this policy change. And since all of that had disappeared. But I was committed to this. And with limited resources, I knew we had to make it happen. But first I needed to build a team that would make it possible to accomplish this. Our organization had no money to hire staff, as I mentioned. I was one of three staff left and I was barely getting paid. While collecting surveys at the local public benefits office, I learned that in order for low-income moms to qualify for childcare benefits, which often cost upwards of one or $2,000 a month, they needed to sign up to volunteer or work for 40 hours a week in an approved site by the workforce office. These policies were the consequence of 1996 Clinton welfare to work bill. And the way that they played out on the ground was devastating. I found that it was easy for me to do data collection in a way and use the survey as a way to do more, right? To engage a broader conversation about our campaign, getting them involved and to use the survey as an organizing tool because so many of the moms that I met waited 40 hours a week, hours in the office lobby of the workforce office, because in the absence of actual host sites to serve as, play, as placements, they needed to fulfill these requirements somehow in order to gain benefits. I approached the workforce about making our organization a site and was able to make it possible for women on our campaign to fulfill their volunteer hours in order to qualify for, for benefits while also being a part of this campaign that developed their voice, enhanced their leadership and, and professional skills, and most importantly, created an invaluable support network. And the woman that I recruited needed this. The leaders on, on the campaign had stories that clearly demonstrated the relationship between hospital practices and policies and the widening disparity between the life expectancies of black babies and white babies. Their stories made it obvious as to why and what contributed to the fact that black babies were three times more likely to die before their first birthday in Miami. And that black mothers, even with 14 years of education, had worse outcomes than white mothers who had a high school diploma. The, there was no, there was very little existing research at that time that discussed it. This was 2013 before the experiences of Beyonce and Serena Williams and other celebrities gave light to what was happening. The only data that we had but beyond the survey that we ended up collecting was these women's stories and their experiences. Women like Ferlandi, my first intern, who gave birth to her oldest daughter while in prison, her feet shackled to the bed while serving seven years for a nonviolent drug offense in Florida prison system. 
she took the pain of these experiences and the anger and channeled them at every breastfeeding coalition meeting or every hearing we spoke up at, hearings where we were often ignored, or women like Don Travia, who though she was homeless, wanted to do everything in her power to give her baby a fighting chance. I knew that breastfeeding would add to her, ba her baby's livelihood and set them up for health outcomes, positive health outcomes later on. When she gave birth, her baby was taken away after delivery in bottle-fed formula. The doctors urged her against breastfeeding and instead encouraged formula. She also went home with the very gift bags that we were fighting to ban through this hospital policy campaign. She later learned that the myriad of health complications her daughter was experiencing as a one and two year old were related to a baby formula allergy. And the very baby formula that she was prescribed was one that was contributing to these problems. We were able to weave these stories in her experiences that she was, she was able to connect with other mothers into a data set that proved with confidence and statistical significance that policies like the aggressive marketing of infant formula through gift bags and through other practices that we were seeing at our hospitals did indeed have a direct relationship to later health issues experienced by mothers and babies. There was also women like Nicole who was pregnant with her third child when she joined as an intern through the workforce office. Nicole, like so many mothers we encountered, wanted a natural birth knew how much healthier it was and how less risky it was, but was coerced into an unnecessary C-section procedure because it was faster and through Medicaid reimbursements made the hospital more money. Alone, all of these mothers were easy to ignore, but together through the data collected at bus stops, at WIC offices and welfare offices, collected while we sat and waited, while families held their children, hoping to see a doctor in emergency room, waiting rooms, who were so happy to have their stories told and represented. The sum of all these stories could not be ignored. We used data to build the power of Black people, not for data's sake, but because all other avenues had been blocked. Data became a vehicle for driving political power. And our political power was not money. It was not media presence. It was not status and titles in the hospital system or Miami political circles. We had none of that. Our political power was a sum of our experiences and the strength of them powerfully and undeniably reflected in the data we collected. Yes, this campaign was successful. On paper, it resulted in concrete and measurable policy change. As I mentioned, our public hospital, the largest in the country by the number of hospital beds, banned the distribution of baby formula and joined a growing number of hospitals in adopting then innovative new practices that were part of the baby friendly hospital accreditation process. But I knew the real impact of this campaign went beyond policy change. It built up the agencies, the agency of these mothers and their ability to fight back. With dignity, it turned a narrative on its head that what was happening to our babies and to our families and to our communities was inevitable. 
or worse, it was the fault of black mothers, fathers, and, and families. But we proved something that I knew then and that I must emphasize now that black communities are impoverished, segregated and defunded by design, a public health and economic crisis created by government and state policies that designated which communities would win and which would lose. In the age of big data, if we do not make building the political power of directly impacted people our North Star, we will continue to not only reproduce, but exacerbate the problems we are desperately trying to solve. And the proportions of these mistakes are deadly. As I have mentioned before, they are not academic, they are not theoretical, they are real. A prime example of this is in the use of race-based risk calculators in, in medicine. There are so many examples to describe, but one in particular is the one that was developed by United Health called the Optum algorithm. Last year, researchers at University of California, Berkeley did something that is often impossible. They broke open a proprietary algorithm developed by the insurance giant United Health. And by breaking it open, by going under the hood, they were able to expose bias that resulted and that contributed in countless deaths of black patients. The study concluded that the algorithm was less likely to refer black people than white people who were equally sick to programs that aim to provide care to patients with complex medical needs. Hospitals and insurers use algorithms like these to help manage care for about 200 people in the US each year. And this one in particular was used on hundreds of millions. The researchers found that the algorithm assigned risk scores to patients on the basis of health cost. They argued that the assumption was reasonable because higher healthcare costs are generally in a vacuum or in the context of a society without structural racism associated with greater health needs. And according to their data, the average black person in the data set had similar overall health costs as white people. But this was misleading. A closer look at the data revealed that the average black person was also substantially sicker than the average white person. Taken together, the data showed that health companies spent an average of $1,800 less per year on black patients than on white patients with the same number of chronic health problems. By using healthcare costs as a proxy for need and making a decision in this algorithm clearly to the selection of this variable and to optimize for such variable, this algorithm reinforced, codified and reinforced deeply ingrained health disparities disparities rooted in judgments about who is worthy of care and who isn't. And as we know, these judgments dictate whether or not one is given treatment and one is not. It happens every day in every hospital room and in check-in rooms all across this country. Just because a policy is new doesn't mean it's innovative. In fact, I have found in my work that technology has the power to take us one step forward and also 10 steps back. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, 
I was overwhelmed by the amount of groups fighting to be the first to publish findings, diagnose the crisis and assert solutions. I read articles with headlines that exploited the disparate impact of COVID-19 on black communities. Studies show that we were bombarded with negative media that justified the mass death of black and Latino people during the pandemic with narratives of cultural pathology, not the realities of structural racism, ignoring the realities of structural racism. And these were the same narratives that the women and families I organized with in Miami also fought against. That these comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, which has a direct link to breastfeeding promotion, by the way, and the lack of breastfeeding and the discouragement of breastfeeding policies, that these comorbidities made black people four times more likely to die from COVID-19 were the result of an absence of self-discipline and self-control rather than the obliteration of choices and the material conditions that made black survival optional and nearly impossible. So we sprang into action. In April of 2020, we convened a movement pulse check, a round table to serve as a pulse check on our movement to explore why people across the US, black people in particular, were vulnerable to COVID-19 and overrepresented in cases and deaths. We had already begun aggregating and working on data collection, but we knew that in addition to doing the data work, we had to shape the narrative. And we had to come together as a community and find ways to organize and mobilize in response. Through the report, through the pulse check, through engaging with decision makers, we urged the public, elected officials, media to understand that race is not a risk factor, but racism is. And that race is not biological, but a history of ideas weaponized through systematic disinvestment, and I have said before, public policy. As we began to have these conversations, organizing our hubs, folks in our movement, reaching out to partners, providing support to people directly on the ground, we began tracking which states we're releasing COVID-19 data on cases and deaths disaggregated by race. We ramped up the demand for all states to report this data in support of monitoring ways that structural racism exacerbated the pandemic. Within a couple of weeks after we did the pulse check, we launched the COVID-19 data tracker project that captured the number of black folks reported as having tested positive for or died from COVID-19. As states began reporting more of this data, we contemplated how that data might change day by day. And we set out on a mission to build a code base that scraped the COVID-19 race and ethnicity data from official state websites into an automated fashion and most importantly, combine these snapshots into a publicly available data set. This work was led by our director of research, Jamel Watson Daniels, who initiated the development of the code base and then trained up and brought on a team of data science and project management volunteers to assist with the development and management of our code base and data set. You can find our data set our public GitHub repo, as well as maps and visualizations on our website, d4bl.org slash COVID-19 hyphen data.
Our goal with this project was to highlight the, heart, the stark disparities in health outcomes related to COVID-19. But the larger goal was to do this in a way that built the political power of our hubs, our network, partner organization, and Black communities as a whole. Otherwise, everything would be in vain. And this work continues, taking this data and putting it into the hands of people who are on the front lines, engaging and struggling with city and officials, city and state chief data officers, research institutions, in an effort to ensure that this moment is about more than temporary reform, but long-term structural change. And as I wrap up, this is the message that I leave you with. Any intervention that does not build the political power, agency, and self-determination of those most vulnerable is liable to harm rather than to help. And any solution that is designed without the involvement of directly impacted people is no solution at all. A big part of our work, perhaps the most important of all the many things we do, is asking ourselves, not just what do we need to do right now, but who do we need to be? Who do we need to be in this moment in time and in an unprecedented time in history while we also continue to engage in the most urgent civil rights battle of our generation, which is the weaponization of data who do we need to be? I pose the same question to every single one of you. And I also invite you to be a part of what we are building, working to reclaim data as power, data as protest, data as accountability, and data as collective action. I look forward to talking more with you all in Q&A. Thank you for your time. That was moving and I really wish we were here in person to be able to um, loudly give a standing ovation. I would be on my seat with thanks for your presentation. Um, before we begin, I, I wanna welcome everyone. My name is Mary Gray. I'm a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research and a faculty affiliate at Harvard University's Center for Internet and Society. It's my pleasure to be in conversation with our keynote speaker today. But before we begin the discussion, two announcements, some housekeeping. I'm joined by Sneha Jha, who will be moderating or monitoring the chat for your questions. So please note that you can submit questions through the Slido function. If we don't get your question during our time together, we'll do our best to address them later on in the FACT 21 conference. Um, and yes, yeah, she may actually slip them into um, her own um, blog post later. And also there's closed caption, uh, captioning available and adjustable via the Slido captioning function. So I would really like a chance to introduce our keynote. I'm sure you can read it in the documents, but I just feel like it's important to note um, her accomplishments before we start. So Yeshiva Vait, Yeshi Milner is the founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. She started Data for Black Lives to break down silos and harness the power of data to make change in the lives of black people. 
Since its founding, Data for Black Lives has raised over $3 million, hosting sold out conferences and convening events to lead the charge to change the conversation around big data and technology across the US and globally. As the founder of Data for Black Lives, Yeshi's work and leadership have received critical acclaim. She's an echoing green black male achievement fellow, an Ashaka fellow, and joins the founders of Black Lives Matter and Occupy Wall Street as a member of the distinguished inaugural class of Roddenberry Foundation Fellows. And in 2020, Yeshi was honored as a Forbes 30 under 30 social entrepreneur. So Yeshi, welcome to FACT 2021. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's really, again, inspiring to have you here and to certainly hear your keynote. I want to start with some nerdy science questions first, because um, I, I can imagine we share um, some, some nerd connection. Um, you shared with us some of the methodology from your earliest work in Miami, and I wanted to slow things down and start there with just how groundbreaking your approach to that work was. And you noted that you're conducting surveys on uh, maternal health. Your description sounds a lot like what some in my research circles would call participatory action research, prioritizing collaboration with research participants and really letting them drive the research agenda. Could you tell us a bit about your data collection methods? How do you translate data as protest, accountability, and collective action into concrete research practices? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a really good question. And for more context around this story that I shared, you know, this was a very special keynote. I really hold the fat community near and dear to my heart. And I really wanted to share, um, to kind of go deeper in this story. Some of you have maybe at, at our conferences or at our events or, may, or maybe read about this story, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper because um, so much of it is what I've leaned on to build D4BL and certainly what we've leaned on as a D4BL team um, to respond to this moment around COVID-19 um, and the impact that it's had on black communities. Um, so, you know, this campaign, as I mentioned in the keynote, I came onto this campaign at this order at the very end. We had gotten, we meaning Power Youth Center for Social Change. This is an organization that I had actually joined when I was in high school. Um, and in response to another question, I'll go back into that story um, where I also was a part of an effort to lead a survey, use that data to advocate, uh, move the needle on policies and push decision-making. Uh, but in that case, it was around uh, police brutality in schools and the school to prison pipeline. In this case, you know, this entire campaign and program at our organization was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And it was part of an initiative called Communities Creating Healthy Environments led by a um, organization called Praxis Project, which I actually eventually went to work on and to help lead that program after I did this. But the idea of this was to really build a, the capacity of grassroots organizing groups um, to bring in research, right? To do the participatory action research that I think so many folks in the field at, up until that point had really saw as a solution. And, you know, I know um, in reality, sometimes it does not really look very participatory and it doesn't look very collaborative, but I know that for me, um, I came into this campaign um, and all I was asked to do was just kind of finish the survey. And, I, and, and once I had finished it, you know, quite quickly because of the skills I had, but also because of um, our partnership through the grant with um, Loyola Marymount University Participatory Action Research Center, right? So I was able to collect the surveys. We would ship, you know, seal them, <laughs> ship them to LA. And in LA, um, the awesome senior researcher there, Glenn Rays, he took them and he literally translated them, coded them into spreadsheets. And then we were able to work with that data, run analysis and compare the findings um, to not just, again, the experiences that folks were um, experiencing in Miami, but also, you know, it, national standards, national data, right? So in particular, the maternity practices and infant nutrition and care and pink survey, right? So this was a survey that 
Um, we borrowed some of the structure, some of the questions from, but when we were developing our own survey questions, even when I was just a high school student on the campaign, not that much involved, um, it, it was a mix of these are the tested questions that folks like the CDC use, but also based on conversations that we're having in the organization, what are the kind of questions that we need to ask? But most importantly, how do we need to do this data collection? And I mean, I just remember even being a high school student be before I graduated and came back to lead this campaign, being in the room with midwives, women from the community and hearing about how when, you know, midwives were the primary care practitioners, health practitioners in Overtown in Miami, which is a historically black community where our organization was based. This was, you know, um, famous where a lot of artists and performers who couldn't live, stay on Miami Beach would, would stay and built homes, very prosperous community that was actually destroyed by the building of I-95. Mm -hmm. um, and the res result was what, what we were experiencing, but it was amazing to sit in the room and hear people say that we were healthier before medicalization. And so, you know, to answer your question, it was, you know, taking things like CDC, right? Working with groups like PARC, you know, it was uh, me leaning on, you know, all the different courses and all the different things that I had learned at a place like Brown where I was able to do that and translating that into um, not only just the research practices, but most importantly, the culture, the environment and the approach of the campaign, right? I mean, when I talk about, it's one thing to create a really, really good cognitively tested survey. It's another thing to, you know, sit in Jackson Memorial Hospital waiting room and talk to moms who are literally experiencing this at the same time and be able to come in. And even though I wasn't a mom, not try to relate, but try to understand and try to hear and try to listen and maybe compare it to experiences that my mom had or that women I knew had, but not trying to relate per se, but more trying to give voice first through this survey and, and letting them know that this is going to be a part of a larger effort, but also using the survey to have to have a deeper organizing conversation about what's going to happen after the survey. And quite mm -hmm. frankly, once people knew that, you know, obviously not try to, you know, influence people's survey results. But I think once folks knew that, OK, my voice is actually going to matter, what I'm saying is actually going to go somewhere and something's going to happen with it and it's going to maybe change my life and, and other moms lives, I'm going to I want to participate and I actually want this to succeed. So yeah. that was really important. I want to pick up something I heard in your last comment of, you know, that you could see you're going to get higher quality data by connecting with people who had experiences that um, were meaningful, important to bring to the analysis. And it, and from what you described in your keynote, you build out, you, you built out this research team of those um, participants, of those women who had these important um, experiences to share and, and beyond sharing that to be able to, to build the case, build the aggregated case of what does this look like? Can you, and I don't wanna turn this into a promo for Brown, but can you say a little bit about what, for the students and teachers in the audience, what were some of the courses, some of the, um, the classes you took that led you to see how to build out that kind of research team, to be able to do this mixture of quantitative and qualitative yeah. approach to data analysis and collection? Yeah, I mean, you know, even before I got to Brown, um, my first time collecting data was in high school, as I mentioned, you know, to very quickly to tell the story. I, t I often talk about it in my Abolish Big Data talks. That's how I introduced the talks. But it was a situation where students that I had grown up with, I was going to a different school, an international baccalaureate school that had its problems, mm -hmm. but was not as bad as the school that lots of my friends and neighbors and folks that I knew grew up with went to. And students there organized a peaceful protest in response to a uh, student, a vice principal putting a 14 year old in a chokehold. Mm -hmm. And sadly, this was very common, but unfortunately, instead of their peaceful protests being seen like, okay, here are young people using nonviolent tactics, here are folks really trying to make their voices heard, getting organized, showing leadership. Um, the, the city and the school district sent in SWAT teams, police cars. I'll, I was at home watching on CNN 
literally headlines saying CNN national news, students riot at Miami Edison. And, and I was like, oh my goodness, first of all, this is not a riot. Second of all, you know, what do we do, right? And I kind of hit the ground running. I, I joined Power U and that's when I got into data collection. We needed data that showed the um, disparate impact of school policies like suspensions, arrest, um, other exclusionary disciplinary policies in schools, right? This was before 2015 when Obama, um, Office of Civil Rights released all this amazing disaggregated by gender, by race data on what was happening in schools around discipline. The data that we were collecting was the first of its kind. We surveyed 600 students. We turned the findings into a comic book and it took us a very long time. That same time where I was working on this campaign, um, we were. I was also working on um, the restorative justice campaign. It took us a long time to get the school to commit to changing policies, but folks use that comic book all over the country. People to this day tell me we used it in Oakland, we used it in New Orleans, we used it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to Brown, I knew what I needed to learn. I was like, I need to improve my data collection, data analysis skills. And I said, okay, you know, I actually, I was a part of Mellon May's program being groomed to go get a PhD. And I had access, you know, I was very eager. I had access to like even before I started, I was emailing, you know, folks in the econ department, my advisor, you know, about getting into higher level econometrics and being a part of grad courses that talked about inequality. I mean, my my junior year to write my thesis, I got into, you know, graduate level. I, I was best friends with Dean Terry Weddle, Dean of the School of Public Health, got into her qualitative methods class, right? This, this was really learning qualitative methods, using, not trying to do qualitative methods to make it quantitative, no, really learning quantitative methods, learning how to ask questions, shape questions, shape surveys. I mean, I did biostatistics, I did linear algebra. <laughs> I mean, I did, you know, it, you know, education quantitative methods. All of these classes I did because in the undergrad classes, they weren't letting students get hands-on with research. They weren't. Mm -hmm. And I needed to get hands-on with research. I needed to be learning R and Stata and coding. I needed to be actually out here able to do research and you know, um, learn how to get IRB approval. You know, Stuff like that was so essential. But I have to say the classes that made the biggest difference was what I ended up majoring in. Most of my classes were 90% were social sciences, kind of computational, but I, I majored in Africana studies. Africana mm -hmm. studies, the requirement was eight classes, but it was here that I learned in classes like African American life in the city. Why, you know, in 20, 2008, when I got to Brown, people all over their country were, were losing their homes and it was impacting black communities the most. I had grown up in, in the US, I'm the daughter of immigrants, but I knew nothing about the black, the great black migration. I knew nothing about homeowners loan corporation and segregation. And for me to come in and to learn that and to connect the dots and also to learn about knowledge production and who owns knowledge and how do we create knowledge and to grapple with these things was really, to be honest, what has actually made, what 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 made me a good researcher and made me able to um, make this data actionable and even more than actionable, make it about protest, accountability and collective action. I feel like whenever I read the reports from your organization, I can see the rigor, I can see the depth of your qualitative mm -hmm. training and I, it's one of the things that I find most compelling because I, and you mentioned this in your keynote, you move your capacity for being able to move stories that often are, you know, um, frankly dismissed in, in more computational circles. They're seen as, you know, uh, maybe less trustworthy or we need to get down to, you know, a more quantitative take on things. I feel like you really flip this and you say, as you note in your keynote, like taking these stories and um, noting how um, individual stories, I think I'm quoting you, individual stories alone are easy to ignore, but stories aggregated become powerful ways to illustrate the need for change. So I want to ask you like something that comes up for me in, in my day job. Sometimes I am constantly pressed to um, to prove that in a quantitative sense. There's a kind of a, either a suspicion or a dissatisfaction with um, being able to draw in those qualitative analyses and match them with, with quantitative 
um, uh, measurements that give us a, a, you know, a, a bigger picture, but I'll get pressed with like, we need more data. We need more data. I find that irritating because at some point I don't really need to show more evidence of structural racism in say the handling of COVID-19. I want to know your secret for being able to stay patient um, and balance that um, request for really deep, rigorous, quantitative measurement of um, a particular um, horrific reality and the political work you do to mobilize stories. Like how do you keep from getting sucked into being asked for more data to make your case? Good question. Well, you know, my answer to that is, you know, this coming from my spiritual practice, not my research practice, but, you know, realizing that we live in a country, in a world, in a time where there is a lot of denial and people mm -hmm. do not want to face the truth. And there was no amount of data that I can show, you know, I, there's nothing I can do if you do not want to face the truth. I mean, 90% of the data that we have in this world w was created in, in what, the last 10, 20 years? How much data do we even know is even valid? How do we know it's not racist? We need mixed methods. We need the qualitative, we need people's stories. For the work that I was doing, it should have taken one baby dying, one mother dying for us to change the policies. But what worked was me realizing, okay, we're going to the meetings, people aren't listening to us. We're even getting kicked out of what I would thought would be good spaces, the breastfeeding coalition spaces, saying things like breastfeeding is a racial justice issue, people did not want to hear. They didn't. And I knew why. I knew that the hospital was getting kickbacks from formula companies. Mm -hmm. I realized that women, infants, and children, WIC, the, that, uh, the um, uh, public benefits program is the largest buyer of infant formula and supports the industry. I, re you know, I was getting trolled by, uh, you know, people uh, like trolling my, my social media article comments, uh, uh, interviews. And a lot of them were, were obviously paid for by some of these companies at Nestle, other ones who why, who, who make the formula? And I had to realize that, you know, perhaps sometimes the truth is in conflict with profit. It is in conflict mm -hmm. with the hoarding of power, but we have to tell the truth and I have to stand on the truth. So yeah. I really don't know what else to say. <laughs> no, I love that. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's, uh, Thank you. I mean, that feels more therapeutic for me, but thank you. That's really oh, helpful. Oh, good. Okay, good. And I mean, practically, I also realized that the hospitals, their reputation was their bread and butter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was the lever to pull. That was how we could hit them in their reputation. It was yeah. a shame that even Mitt Romney in Massachusetts had passed the Baby Friendly Hospital Association policies. And in Florida, we had our, at the largest public hospital, people did not want to do it because it was in conflict with profit and the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in addition to doing the survey and doing all this other stuff, using other data, quantity, it, once we got that working with journalism, journalists telling, doing press conferences, once we got the data out, it was, they, they could not ignore it. So, so I'm going to quote you. Race is not a risk factor. Racism is. Uh, I feel like your description of the horrific and perhaps predictable role of United Health's uh, optimum calculator uh, played out uh, furthering health disparities and harm for Black and Brown patients is, is such an illustration of that point. I mean, it, I think for, for me, for anyone right now I know doing research, um, who has any connection with the realities of, of what it looks like to be part of marginalized communities and what kind of absence of healthcare is just a, a fact of life. Uh, your statement just resonates. Um, I would really love to hear your sense of the responsibilities of scholars um, and particularly uh, you know, folks attending here when it comes to the fight to use data as, as you put it, for protest, accountability and collective action, where do academics fit um, in the work that uh, D4BL does uh, when it calls for um, us to abolish big data? 
and maybe a place to start would be explaining what does abolish big data mean? I think, yeah, you know, I, the, I, what I did today with this keynote was another version of abolish big data, but without ever even saying it, right? It is about dismantling the structures that uh, concentrate the power of data into the hands of a few and putting it into the hands of people who need it the most, right? You know, I think I've been very clear about who I define as who need it the most. I know sometimes that's up for debate for people, but you know, that's really what it is. And um, for, for me, you know, abolition is about reimagining systems. It is about some destruction, but it mostly is about creating something new new ways of understanding, new ways of relating to each other, new ways of working, new ways of doing research, new processes, new systems. And this requires a lot of creativity. And I think um, um, this is why we exist as, as D4BL and the role that academics play is significant, right? I started this movement because I wanted to create a space for academics as well as for activists. There's a lot of academics who are activists. A good portion of our hubs program are folks who are academics, a good portion of folks who come to our program, who come to our conference um, are academics. And I think that there is certainly a lot of responsibility, but I think um, what we're trying to do and, and, and what I believe our model of change is that by, you know, breaking down these silos, by creating spaces where people can kind of come in and take off whatever hats they're wearing and really be able to hear and relate to people. And again, let's talk about the word relate, right? Understand, hear, suspend, right? You know, mm -hmm. one of the questions you asked earlier was about what should people learn? If there is some unlearning that needs to happen, mm -hmm. you know? And oftentimes that unlearning can't happen unless you're actually in a space with somebody who, you know, I, you know, my co-founder Lucas, he just finished his PhD in math and you know, I remember when we were first trying to get, um, you know, support at, you know, um, MIT, which was, you know, very, MIT, the president folks were very supportive of D4BL, but, you know, in, in the School of Sciences, we, you know, we were told this isn't science, this is whatever. And sadly, you know, that's the reality that lots of folks face when they go into academia. I wanted to go into academia, but, I, but then I said, you know what, maybe I, what I really want to do is build an alternative institution a space that is unbought, unbought, and that's created for where people, whether they have a PhD, whether they understand some of these technical things that, that we're talking about can come in, for folks who have no experience can come in and be a part of something and have a political home and help build something too. So, you know, um, is the responsibility great? Absolutely, is, is there a lot of urgency for sure? But is there community, is there support, is there self-accountability? Does a movement exist? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I want to invite everybody to be a part of what, what we're building. I love that you um, define what you're doing as an alternative institution, because I can absolutely see it both as the bridge and maybe the, um, the safe space, like you said, to be able to take off hats. And I, I you know, that's, that's really brilliant. And I, I love the way you're thinking about that. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, as we were just talking about, I feel like anybody who was familiar with health disparities um, could have seen what was going to happen a mile away. You know, I don't think anyone was surprised that lo and behold, there were particular groups that were hardest hit by COVID. And lo and behold, the delay on being able to um, prioritize their needs uh, continues to this day. So, you know, uh, my sense from some circles was, uh, depending on where you were, it was really tough to get um, granular data on, on race, that nobody wanted to either collect it or disclose it if they had collected it at specific hospitals, for example. Could you share your thoughts on the value of collecting race and perhaps even as challenging thinking about where are there are places where we want to think about um, the challenges, the complexities of categorizing race in, um, um, in a racially complicated uh, world, particularly when you're thinking about questions of structural racism that give people two boxes to choose <laughs> um, and you have to pick either or. So could you just just share your thoughts on the collection of yeah, that kind of data? This is a big question. I want to be mindful of the time and I want to go into detail, but... I know. 
you know, I think a lot of the folks who are kind of against disaggregation by race, I oftentimes I don't really hear the, like if the conversation was, well, we don't want to further discriminate, we don't want to whatever, that maybe in the research community, but when we're talking about how research use, which is put into public policy and in the state of, and in COVID immediately, data being immediately translated into public policy, it's really important, right? You know, we have our hubs program and while we're not extending the program this year, we've been talking, I've been talking to folks in places like Paris and I mean, now we have a Canada hub where they don't collect race, race data, you know? And that's not for equity reasons, that is the opposite. It is in order to kind of not bring attention and bring light to disparities, right? And I think Obviously, we know that there's ways you know, we, even which the data collection process can can be weaponized. But again, our theory of change is that if you have folks who are actually directly impacted by that, if you have a diverse set of folks, and that does not have to be the case. But you know, um, I guess my final thought on even the categorization piece, you know, I think it's really important to know. You know, for me, that's why studying Africana studies was very important. Was knowing that race is not biological that you know, the definition that I got was that race is a history of ideas, right? Um, it is history of ideas that is um, operationalized through policy, through history, through culture, through, through, through narratives. And I think it's a categorical system that we use just in order to kind of make sense of stuff. But at the same time, you know, it is a social construct and is a quite very, it's a very powerful one, right? And I think, obviously giving people the opportunity to, to self-identify, mm -hmm. uh, but being very intentional that these are the categories that, that we're using. And also these, these are how these categories were created. How was whiteness created in this country? That is a very important conversation to have. Yeah. You know, how did folks who came in who were not white over the generations became white? I think that's an, is, that's important just as blackness is, right? So I don't think it's, I think it's important to categorize by race what is dangerous when that it's just kind of in this idea that there's a, that it's in a vacuum and yeah. it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have 30 seconds and I want you to tell us, you've got a big fan base here. What do you feel is the one thing we should do tomorrow to be able to put data as protest accountability and action into practice? You know what? I want to share a quote that our national organizing director Tawada shared at our hubs gathering, where she talked about how often when we're in movements, we feel compelled to move, but sometimes we need to pause. You know, I posed that my at the end of my keynote. Maybe it's not asking what do we need to do, but who do we need to be? Part of that is thinking what do we need to unlearn? What are the ways in which ideas and thoughts and biases have maybe creeped in? How are we programmed? Um, and creating space within ourselves to lovingly, but to really and rigorously reflect on that. And then I think from there, we can make the conscious principled steps to be a part of something bigger. And if anyone wants support in doing this, please join our movement, come to Data for Black Lives and we wanna create a space for you. And anyway, I love you all. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Mary, for this great keynote and, and, and for the Q&A and for these wonderful questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all your work and I'll be there tomorrow for sure. So thank you. Yes, great. Take care. Good health.